this is the um, uh, Climate and Gender in Asia panel. And I'm really excited about this, not only because these women, as you will find out, are complete rock stars in what they do, but um, gender and climate are both um, topics that are um, near and dear to my heart. And I think we all know um, women are you know, disproportionately affected by a lot of things, including climate change and plastics pollution. And they're also very entrepreneurial um, and a big part of the potential solutions to that. So um, uh, we have an amazing panel here today. And they're, um, uh, what I loved about our, our prep call is that you all know each other and you like work together all the time. So it's a very collaborative spirit. And I think our, our panel will um, uh, continue that spirit. Um, and um, they're building ecosystems, supporting women entrepreneurs on the front lines of climate change, and they're also mobilizing investors across Asia. Um, so um, I will quickly introduce you each and then let you introduce yourself and your work uh, more fully. So starting from... Um, my left, uh, we have Priya Thachati, who is um, co-founder and chairman of Vilgro Philippines. Um, Ragula Shag, who is the founding partner with Circulate Capital um, in Singapore. And Ayaka Matsuno, um, who leads the Gender Investment and Innovation Program at Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan. And let me know if I mispronounce anything. Um, and so we're going to dive into some of the challenges that they're seeing and the way that the ways that they're addressing some of those challenges um, to um, build a support system for women um, and an ecosystem of, um, of social entrepreneurship and also investment um, across Asia. But before we jump in, I mean, I feel like any discussion about gender um, I would be remiss to not mention a big champion of, um, of women entrepreneurs and gender lens investing, which is um, Suzanne Beagle, who um, passed away uh, recently, very recently, unfortunately. And, um, but I think her, her 2X initiative lives on and, and her legacy. And I know a lot of you are working with 2X, and we actually are partnering with them as well at Impact Alpha. Just to say a word about Impact Alpha, by the way, um, I, I'm editorial director there and I lead our climate coverage and we're um, a media site and a newsletter um, that covers the impact investing world um, globally and across um, all sorts of sectors. So um, I love this kind of um, cross-sectoral, intersectional um, type of discussion. So with that, um, why don't you each um, introduce yourself and your work, and maybe kind of situated in which regions of Asia that you're you're working in. I can, I can go first. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Priya. Uh, I'm based in Manila in the Philippines, uh, which is where I've lived over the last seven years. Uh, I founded or co-founded an incubator that supports um, early stage entrepreneurs who are addressing you know social and climate issues. Um, over the last three years, we've really thought about and very intentionally worked on adding uh, a gender lens or, you know, we call ourselves a gender smart incubator. And that work has led to the creation of many other sort of initiatives. But I, I would say, you know, I describe myself as an ecosystem builder, uh, really focused on the missing middle, uh, sort of helping entrepreneurs cross that valley of death. And um, I think the challenges that we see today in the ecosystem is, you know, even though it's evolved globally, is that um, it gender, yes, but not in isolation. It is if you're not in the big cities, if you're not speaking English very well, if you're not making fancy uh, pitch decks, it becomes very difficult to unlock capital. And so that's really what we are focused on. 80% uh, of our work is in the Philippines, 20% more regionally in Southeast Asia. So we also have an investment arm, which is really bringing investors together. And we also have a platform for women entrepreneurs really focused on unlocking capital. And, and these are the areas where I've collaborated with these fabulous uh, women next to me as well. So it's very quickly about me. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. First and foremost, uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, and it's such a lovely group, so I feel quite comfortable. Uh, my name is Regula. I'm based in Singapore. I am 
uh, for those who, who may not know, um, I work for Circular Capital, and Circular Capital is an impact-driven and uh, investment manager focusing on the circular economy. Um, we invest in uh, innovation and uh, supply chain to prevent plastic leaking into the ocean. We do that in, in by, by uh, providing equity to entrepreneurs in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, but also most re recently we started actually working on in Latin America, Caribbean as well. And um, often when we talk about plastic, people may not, not understand what it has to do with climate. But when we look at the greenhouse gas emission, while uh, we talk about just uh, transition and, and, and energy transition, but actually the, the production and consumption of goods uh, makes up 49% uh, of the entire footprint we have on, on, on the planet. So plastic and packaging is a, is a big part of it. And therefore, when we talk about climate and climate change, um, preventing plastic being burned or leaking into the ocean, dissolving or ending up in our bodies is, uh, is, uh, is a big contributor to, to the emission reduction. Now, everybody also usually associates environmental aspects to, to investing in, in, in ocean plastic prevention, but there actually is also a big social aspect to it, and the S is really important. Why is the S so important? And here comes also the gender aspect, is that um, women play a key part in the supply chain of material recovery, plastic recycling, and waste management. In... Um, Alone, in, in some of the cities, for example, in Pune in India, 90% of the material recovered is recovered by women. And, and generally, the majority of, of plastic recovered and recycled in the world is actually recovered by, by the informal sector, where women play a key role to contribute to the income of families. But women so are, are the consumers, right? They have quite some power in, in consumption. Uh, they make decisions. Women are the head, at the head of household. So women are also very critical in, 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 in changing the mindset of how we deal with waste or plastic and, and our consumption. Women are um, entrepreneurs. And in the supply chain of plastic recycling, there is such a huge group of women entrepreneurs in, in the Philippines where, where you work and we've been engaging also on, on together is that f almost 40% of the junk shops are women owned. But women don't have access to capital. And we as a, a um, circular economy driven investor with a strong focus on E, but also on the S, really come in and trying to understand what are the needs of the women along the supply chain and then how can we tailor our solutions to that. And we can talk later about how we do this, but just put it into context. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayaka Matsuno. I'm the director of Impact uh, <coughs> Gender Investment and Innovation Program of the Sasakao Peace Foundation. Um, thank you very much for coming. I know that it's late in the afternoon, <laughs> but I'm very glad that to be here. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to you know, give you a little bit of background of what Sasakao Peace Foundation is. The Sasakao Peace Foundation is a Japanese private charitable foundation based in Tokyo, Japan. And then in terms of the, the asset under management, we are the largest. And then we have some operations mostly um, between Japan and overseas because we have a parent organization focusing in the issue in Japan. So we try to really facilitate our work, international collaboration, cooperation, and also mutual exchange. So that's what we do. And women empowerment is one of the five key strategies strategies in, in Sasaka Peace Foundation. And then my team, Gender Investment and Innovation Program, we, we work definitely to you know promote women's economic empowerment and also gender equality through so basically two approaches so one is through asia women Inc impact fund so this asia women impact fund is a very unique vehicle for us um, not many asian foundation has this kind of you know initiative we we took the part of um, our endowment and then apply a gender lens to really try to bring about positive outcome for women and girls in Asia specifically through our investments. 
So that's number one. And therefore, you know, we are promoting gender lens investing. So we, we are here, there, and then we, we know all, the, all of us each together. <clears throat> And then also, another part is that uh, we are a foundation and we have the different pockets for program funding. So we try to really work together with the local uh, organizations to really work together to create entrepreneurship support um, ecosystem, more gender smart. And also sometimes we have program particularly for women entrepreneurs. So in that context, we work together uh, in, in the Philippines with Priya. So, and then on top of that, we are a think tank as well. So we try to, you know, have some research that is very interesting and then try to move the needle for gender, gender equality in the region. And then um, one thing that we did a couple years ago together with Susan Beagle was um, gender lens investing landscaping report that really covers that um, private and then public markets and then try to, you know, uh, capture all the vehicles that are available. And also recently, uh, we published a report called Financing the Blue Economy in Asia. So we wanted to really highlight a little bit of blue economy today. So that's why I, you know, joined this session. Thank you. Okay, great. So as you can see, they're um, very busy working on many different levels um, across Asia. Um, so... Let's talk about the opportunity for um, investing in climate and gender um, generally, but, but Asia in particular. So can you all talk a little bit about what drives your work, like what the thesis is, um, what you're trying to do, and then, um, then we're going to get into um, the challenges as well um, and, and how you're addressing them. But let's focus on the opportunity case first. Well, I already, <laughs> most of it said it. Um, I mean, we see the opportunity really by by enabling the women within the plastic recycling supply chain to get um, access to capital, to get access to, to um, uh, leadership opportunities. So I think that is really key for us because, as I mentioned before, the women play a key role in it because they, they either collect the material, their household, head of households, uh, the entrepreneurs. In a lot of the businesses we're investing in, um, these are all family businesses and the women often play a key part in it. They may not be the CEO, but they can be, or, you know, but they play a key part in building those businesses and attracting for additional women. Um, what we see in the, in the industry is the informal sector being obviously as always most vulnerable where the women play a key role. And when we invest in our companies where we see tremendous opportunities by acknowledging that there is an informal sector, um, that the informal sector has been critical in collecting the material, and by doing that then also be very clear that we need to ensure that when we build and we invest and build sustainable supply chains for material recovery plastic that um, the women in the system everyone in the system but particularly the women most vulnerable have fair wages are protected um, that they are given all the support they need through in, in, in wherever they work through through the supply chain. Um, that is really important. Human rights violation happen, and we in 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 the companies we invest in make sure that we have the transparency along the supply chain. We call it a um, sustainable sourcing framework, which we have developed together with some DFIs we invested in our fund to ensure that tier one back and steps back all the way upstream, that we understand who is working in the supply chain, under what conditions, that they're fairly paid, it's documented, it's fully transparent and traceable. Um, that's the only way we can actually do um, good business, right, uh, by having pro uh, a real impact. That is really critical for us to make sure that what we do, we do right. Um, beyond that, we uh, we invest a lot in women as well because we see throughout the supply chain again that these women entrepreneurs, by not having access to capital, often also don't have access to, to procurement. Um, some of our key investors are some of the biggest brands, the consumer good companies. And... 
I truly believe, and I, I, we've seen it before in, in the other panel just before us, is that while small and mid-sized enterprises in Asia obviously make the majority of jobs, the, the biggest contribution to GDP, and a lot of, or, or, or and often up to 50 and 60% of these businesses are actually women-owned, they actually have hardly any access to procurement neither in corporations nor in the government. In Indonesia, 64% of small and mid-sized enterprises are women-owned, but they have 0.25% of the, the government procurement. Yeah. So this is, these are, and this is not just in plastic, I'm talking here general numbers out there. And so what I think what we need to do as a, as a, as a, uh, investor who is, is is socially conscious and is focused on ESG or impact that we fully understand the needs of women along the entire supply chain and tailor the, the, the solutions to their needs and exactly and in, and in our case it is as simple as making sure that the women who, who work in the different along the supply chain have access to to, to toilets or that we know where their children are when they work, right? And and these are all the very simple steps which I think are can be implemented to ensure that the women um, are participating uh, properly within the supply chain. Well, that that brings it into um, stark relief. Yeah, um, Ayaka. Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment about this procurement. So I am uh, representing Japan for W20, which is a um, D G20 civil engagement group. So each year we have this uh, communique, basically trying to really put the, the women's issues, <coughs> concerns, and then try to really do the lobby for G20 leaders declaration. So each year we mention about this procurement gender responsible procurement program. That's something that we need to have in G20 countries as well. So you pointed out a very important point. So going back to these um, opportunities, I have three opportunities and I'm gonna be a little bit high level, bear with me. But um, so impact investing in general is very much growing, not only globally, but then in, in Asia. And also in Japan, finally, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the giant or the tiger has woken up. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida, uh, the current Prime Minister, started to really talk about new form of um, capitalism. And then impact investing is one of the tools that he wants to really you know, promote. And then for, in his plan of this new form of capitalism, this impact investing, was mentioned and tried to really you know, build on. So now at the moment, I think, I don't know whether you met Japanese crowd here, but then we brought some Japanese entrepreneurs who could really lead the impact economy in Japan. So even in Japan, that num number is growing, um, interested investors as well, it's growing. So, and then as you know, Japan is very much lagging behind in terms of gender equality. We are always the bottom of the OECD countries and then we are not proud of that. We know that we need to do something and we are making some efforts, but then still, it's not enough. So it's high time for Japanese government and then also the corporate, the private sector as well. So they started to pay more attention to gender equality. So I can really see the impact investing and also the more money coming into Asia, including Japan, and the more attention given to gender equality. Number two is that the ultra high net worth individuals is growing globally, but then in Asia, you mentioned, but then it's the fastest, fastest growing um, region in terms of the number of high net worth individuals. And then the wealth transfer is happening between 2020 to 2030. And then so the boomers to the, the millennial, the Gen, Gen Z, they have a little bit more aligned to sustainable economy, yeah? So we can really see that impact investing can be their you know, go-to idea in terms of strategy. So that's a huge opportunity and and then the third one, I just wanted to talk about blue economy, but then before doing that, I wanted to you know, go back to that the climate finance. 
Uh, so 20 years ago, so from the Rio, you know, the climate finance started to really boom because of the financial gap. And then the green bonds came up. And then now that everybody is talking about intersection between climate change and in gender, right? And then even this year's G20 leaders declaration for the first time, the intersection between the climate change and then in, in gender was clearly mentioned. And we need to do something about that. So I can really see the trend coming in. And then at the same time, this blue economy started to really be coming into the discussion five years ago or so. Because the SDG 14, the life below water, is the most underfunded SDGs. And then we are talking about 5.5 trillion US dollars only in Asia. That is the financial gap for this SDG 14. So now we started to hear that the blue finance coming up with different kind of instruments like blue bonds, blue loans. So our our report, latest report, if you're interested, please go visit my organization, Sasaka Peace Foundation website. But then we could really see that the trend of increasing the number of uh, blue bond, blue loans coming up for the last five years. Now up to uh, 10 billion US dollars uh, in size and then also 51 in number all around the globe. And then 53% of them are coming from Asia because Asia is so much depending on blue economy. Yeah, so I can really see that the soon enough, this gender concerns will be discussed in the context of blue economy as well. So this is an opportunity for us. So I wanted to highlight three opportunities. And you had a couple of opportunities in your um, report, right, where there were blue bonds looking at gender and um, blue economy. Yes, yes. So actually, at this point, the investors cannot really think of gender uh, consideration in the blue bond <laughs> because it's a little bit too much. They're doing this and doing that and then adding on to the gender equality into that picture. But then just like, you know, uh, regular mentioned, blue economy is very much women's business as well, and especially informal economy, formal economy. You know, they might be 20% of the fisheries workforce, only 20%, but when we are talking about the second layer, which is the back end of the fishing industry, you know, all the fish processing and then aquaculture and all those things are done by women. But then they are 35% uh, less uh, remunerated for the same amount of work that men do in aquaculture. So there is a huge overlook for women's contribution. So we think that you know this is something that we need to be integrated into the str uh, investment strategy soon enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then not many cases are happening. There, there are some, uh, one in with IFC uh, project and then also another one in the ADB, but still to be coming. Okay, so even in the opportunities, um, the challenges come out, right? But let's let's dive more deeply into the challenges that um, women, um, social entrepreneurs, particularly in the climate um, or or you know circular space, face, and more you know more in depth about how you're each um, addressing those challenges and what more needs to be done. So. It's just so fascinating. I was like <laughs> thinking, I have to say, I downloaded the report oh, last thank week. Thank you. And I've been studying you. it very, very much in detail because it is a very um, exciting area, especially for the region that we are in, uh, because that is also coastal communities are also most vulnerable to climate change. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be a critical piece in you know, anything that we need to address across gender and climate. But let me focus on this question because you know, I have a longer chance. I'll give them a break. But uh, you know, for us, as, uh, you know, as a gender smart incubator, the last three years, this is an issue that we've been focusing on quite a lot. Because uh, as both Regula and Ayaka mentioned, the capital issue continues to be a huge problem. I don't think it's a problem only for women entrepreneurs. It is a problem at the stage. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, women and other genders, as well as when you look at the other factors like geography, socioeconomic class, whether you studied abroad or not, all of these factors 
very critically effective, you know, in entrepreneurs' ability to fundraise. And so we've actually also done a small research, tiny, uh, you know, in, with support from the Sasakawa Peace Foundation very recently on the gender financing gap in the Philippines, because we have all these stories and we're like, okay, we have to have more data. <laughs> so there are a few pieces that really stood out. And of course, the number one, the most common one, I think all of us are aware of is the lack of networks and access to information. Information is so key. Now, unless you're in a big city and in, you know, going to the startup events or people in your social media network are posting these opportunities, it's very, very unlikely that you'll actually find out even who's out there, what is out there. So I think lack of, you know, access to the information and then if you got the information, lack of access to the networks of getting to the investors continues to be a huge problem. But we also kind of surfaced a few more, which, you know, the women entrepreneurs kind of mentioned. Um, I think the second very interesting piece that, you know, we had not really considered is around, uh, so there are three issues, I would say. I would put it as uh, mismatch of fit, need, and perceptions. So let me start with perceptions because it's a very interesting piece, is that most women entrepreneurs that we spoke to in this research, and we had about 100, uh, identified that, they actually postpone fundraising as much as they can. They prefer to grow organically first and borrow from friends and family, which sounds okay, but friends and family also don't know the risks of you know, startup businesses, so it can be quite tricky, especially in the cultural settings, you know, uh, as in Southeast Asia. So that is what their preference is. Uh, and they uh, try to push out fundraising as much. And there are two reasons for it. One is that when, the, and maybe it, it is all of us as well. When they close their eyes and think about who's a successful entrepreneur, they're not really thinking of any women entrepreneurs, definitely not someone who looks like them. So that was one. So the, the second piece of the perception was that unless like you studied abroad or had like, especially in the Philippines, to a large extent in Indonesia as well, your family connections really is what unlocks capital. And so if these two categories you didn't fit into, then it becomes really challenging of how do I navigate fundraising. So the perceptions in the minds of the women entrepreneurs of who can actually fundraise, who can access financing, continues to be a huge barrier. Of course, much of it is true. Some of it is also that, of course, negative stories like percolate more in the ecosystem <laughs> than the positive ones. And we don't actually tell many of these stories uh, as often as we should. So I think that has been a big case. The third piece, which is the fit and the need, has been that we discovered that a lot of the financing needed is actually smaller ticket sizes and tailored and appropriate. So tailored in the sense to whatever their business is based on their cash flow cycles, revenue-based financing, those type of things don't exist. Appropriate in the sense, do you actually need equity investment? Can you actually provide these market returns? Most of them cannot. So what other financing options are there? And I think the narrative in the investment circles is really about hypergrowth, venture capital primarily. And 90% of the entrepreneurs actually don't need, will not need that, or at least don't need it immediately. Maybe they will figure out if they need it later on. But actually, there is not many other conversations of any other forms of capital. And so that becomes quite limiting. And then, of course, the availability of anybody who can do anything tailored. There's very few people. So that's really kind of the big issues that they're facing. I think there's one piece I want to say. There are two pieces, both on the investor side. Of course, this is a conference of impact investors. I don't think anybody believes that they are gender biased. Everybody believes that we are gender blind, which is the case with most investors that we speak to. Everyone is gender blind. But somehow we still have this problem of <laughs> not enough uh, women and you know diverse entrepreneurs getting cap capital. But there is an issue of, I think, an investor's literacy and also an investment literacy for women entrepreneurs. Many times it's packaged as financial literacy for women. I think that's wrong because actually they're very good at, with the money at home, in their business, helping the family. But what actually they're lacking is investment literacy. They don't know how to navigate. They don't know what type of instrument is appropriate for them. So that's the piece that we have to address. And on the investor side, uh, the investor literacy really comes from majority of the deals if you look at in Southeast Asia. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to about 50 investors because most it's a small community, you know, is the primary way that they get the deal is through referrals or word of mouth. Now that and then they're, they're in where, you know, the bias sort of comes in, right? Like, because that's how investors, we have heard mentality. Like, if you tell me, if regular tells me, look at this company, I will jump into it and trust it um, and, you know, go with it. And so it depends on who we are talking to. And so the investors literacy where we all believe we are gender blind, um, I think we also have to challenge that. And, you know, there are a lot of amazing conversations happening. 
But I think to see the shift, I think you made a very important point. How many lenses do we add? And that is sometimes also what we do is that everybody, of course, wants to fund more female entrepreneurs or diverse entrepreneurs. But they're like, okay, but can I formally adopt this? Oh, then I'm like limiting, you know, myself. And in a young ecosystem where deals for certain types of capital are small, that becomes a challenge on the investor side. So these are some of the big sort of issues that we are facing on the ground. I just wanted to, you know, agree everything that she said. That's all the challenge that we face. Another one on top of that, I just wanted to, you know, highlight that um, there are now the hype of women entrepreneurs yeah. globally. There are so many programs that are mushrooming up, I have to say, but then not necessarily working together and collaborating. And then, you know, even if we say women entrepreneurs, we, have, we can really think about different segments of women entrepreneurs and then different business models or that the social enterprise who doesn't need to have to scale too much or the uni unicorn type, all under the umbrella of women entrepreneurs. <laughs> and everybody wants to have the program. So I find that on the ground, some women entrepreneurs just become a bunny and hop, hop, hop to one accelerator to another, seriously. But then that's not gonna help them, unfortunately. We, we, everybody has good intention. Everybody thinks that this is the way to support them. But at the end of the day, we need to you know, kind of you know, line up in the chain of uh, support yeah, and then try to really be um, helpful as possible from the start, uh, initial stage to um, sus become sustainable. Right. So I th I see that, that this is a kind of silo type of uh, programming at the ecosystem level is a challenge. But I think it's not just for women, right? Generally, mm -hmm. all yeah. these acceleration programs or th th that a lot of the entrepreneurs hop from one to the next. Yeah. Um, and, and actually then really leapfrogging to the next level is very difficult and, and, and then never grow to the level where we could invest. Mm -hmm. um, we are investing in, in uh, mid-sized enterprises, growth companies, um, where we see, because we, when we look at the sheer volume of material we need to handle, particularly in Asia or, or also in Latin America, while small startups or startups are important for the future pipeline right now we have a big issue at hand and so we need to invest in companies which have the capability to actually go big right and fast um so when we look at obviously when we look at the challenges yes i i agree with everything you both said for us it is generally also the biggest challenge is capital um we have been raising I would say rather successfully, uh, almost $250 million in the last four years. Um, but when we look at the overall industry we're in, and, and, and we need billions of dollars alone in Asia to stem the, the, the tide of the waste going into the ocean. And so it's not women only have problems getting capital. It's generally the industry which doesn't get the capital because the, the traditional financial industry has not seen it as an investment opportunity. Um, and, uh, and 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 I would say it's 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 possibly stigmatized. It's not sexy. It is waste, right? So it has not been seen as value, but that is changing right now. But when we look at okay, we have a general understanding. There's a huge capital gap in the region in Asia for the industry we want to build. But then it gets even worse for women exactly in the industry, and uh, and therefore we as an investor. Um, starting 2018 in 2020 then really looked started adapting our investment strategy to be much more gender smart and we did that with Suzanne that we started really looking at how do we as investor operate and I think for me while I, I truly believe we need to have a diverse group of people in every sector of a corporation in on in everywhere where we operate particularly from an investments perspective, investors are biased. And if we continue to have the majority of the capital in the hands of male investors, it's not going to change because we need to start being very diverse. Um, IFC has done a study where they say if funds or investment managers who are really um, diverse, not either 
male or female or but really diverse have on average 20 10 to 20 percent uh, um, higher returns and and so what I think is what we also realize is that if you want to attract more women you want to find these women because they're out there you just may have to look and look yeah. for them but they're out then we need to also adapt the way we make decisions. And so we looked at our entire investment uh, due diligence or an investment analysis process and brought in all these aspects of gender, gender smart investing and we've did that with Suzanne and, and Sagana. And it is really interesting because I, I agree it's, 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 it's we're blind or we're biased or we're unconscious. But once I myself have been really feeling like advocating for this looking at what kind of questions we start asking throughout the due diligence process once we start thinking about it, how we assess it, what data we need, what gender disaggregated data we need is so critical to then actually make the proper investment decisions. Because we heard that in the panel before in here also is that ultimately if we don't have those tools, those questions very structured throughout the investment process, what we're ending up is having you know, women asking more and more questions to women and being much more rigorous with them. Mm. Um, and so I think that that is really critical what, so that we are really clear in how we assess deals. On the other flip side is also what we do is that with the companies we engage in, that we, most of them are still majority male managed or owned, but as part of the process, we assess where can we start changing the mindset? What are targets we can um, in, uh, agree jointly work towards to bring more women in, in all these positions where we think it is critical to have women in? What are the policies we need to have the women protected. Um, and so the portfolio companies we operate in, even before we invest, we have a clear action plan um, where we then define what we what we jointly think is critical and where the journey should go. And that is, I have seen, astonishingly well embraced, actually. If if it is not something you push on something, someone, but it's something you jointly believe in and start developing, then that is really an amazing journey to be on. And we've seen positive, enormous positive impact in how very male dominant businesses have started changing. And with that comes innovation, which take targets women, etc. And it's just a totally different ballgame. But I really believe the investors have a key role to play. And fair to say that um in Asia, there is a general lack of women investors, yourselves excluded, right? There is, yes. But I think uh, there is also, you know, that I think we, we really need to encourage all women who, who are have an interest in the industry to step up and and and, uh, and and step into these roles. They are out there. It's like always people feel like, oh, we can't find them. No, it's not true. We have at Circular Capital... Um, the majority of our leadership team is female. Um, we have a very good healthy balance of female, male investment professionals. And throughout the entire, all the departments or, or whatever we call them, teams, um, we have a very healthy balance. Uh, male, female, cultures, backgrounds. And I think uh, that enriches enormously. And there again, the the, 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 the the saying that A, we don't have enough data to make the case, or B, yeah. there's not enough talent out there. It's not true. We just have to open our eyes and look for them Absolutely. and bring them I'm, in and foster them. Yeah. I agree. I, I'm currently in a program with 2X called 2X Ignite, which supports first-time fund managers. And I think that group has a lot of... Uh, First time women fund managers. I know this, but I think the challenge is also that there aren't many, and so there will be many first time female fund managers. And I think that's a new crop of people. And I don't know if, you know, the funder world is, you know, it's new for them as well. So I think it's tough. There are people getting into it, but maybe not enough. But also to navigate it is not easy. I know that, you know, there's many of us raising funds. Uh, Lisa is, I am. And uh, it's a pretty scary world out there and challenging because uh, we also, we need to build track record, but we can't do that without somebody funding us. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, 
but by tricky. by having more uh, investors or LPs, right, who are female, Absolutely. then uh, and 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 then there is an opportunity, hopefully, that that they are willing to invest. But I agree with you, particularly first first time funders, uh, investors, right, investment firms. It's it's difficult anyhow, and, and it is more more difficult for women. But we'll still do it. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I just wanted to add on what Regra mentioned. I think it's very important to highlight the you know due diligence part and then have a framework so that you can really keep track on the impact. So at the end of the day, it's an impact investing. So we have to really measure, manage, and the impact. And then for that, you know, we need to also integrate the gender lens into it. So our fund, Asia Women Impact Fund. We recently um, published the first impact measurement and management framework. So please, you know, I have some copies if you, if you are interested, I can share that with you. But then <clears throat> it was very important for us to really have the set of, you know, uh, uh, theory of change and then started from there. You know, we could put the you know, criteria to do the due diligence to make sure that this is um, bringing the outcome that we desire for women and girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one thing that you wanted to, uh, you highlighted. Another things, you always mentioned about the business case of the intersection of um, climate change and gender. Mm -hmm. I wanted to you know, share one, um, another research that we did two years <laughs> ago with Blo Bloomberg, New Energy Finance. That was very interesting. So I would like you to you know, take a look at the world. Mm -hmm. So we did the, it's a private, uh, public market, sorry. But then Bloomberg had this ESG data of 11,700 co uh, companies in 102 countries. Mm. So utilizing that the database, we wanted to see the correlation between um, gender diversity at the board level, and management level, and the workplace, you know, workforce, and the climate performance, governance, and innovation. And we could clearly see the co positive correlation between the gender diversity at the board level especially over 30% of women in the board, has clear positive indication of the uh, climate change governance and also innovation. And in the governance, we are talking about mainly the climate-related data disclosure and also the international framework like TCFD and th things like that, whether they can really align their, program, their companies to adopt that. So there is a clear linkage between climate change and then gender diversity. Great. And I know um, a lot of um, people have come in since we started. Feel free to move up. But also, um, we will be taking questions. But if anyone has a, a, um, a question that's relevant to like what we're talking about at the moment, feel free to you know, um, raise your hand, and, and we'll just keep it interactive like that. Um, I would love to hear examples of some of your work, right, to really bring it to life. Um, you're working with entrepreneurs at this intersection. You're, you know, helping um, cultivate new investors and, and ecosystems. So um, maybe each of you could, you know, give an example or two that kind of illustrates the type of work you're doing and how it's, um, uh, you know, addressing some of these many, many challenges that you've all articulated so well. Sure. I think, yes, collaboration, that's the key. We're not going to get anywhere without it. And uh, I think and it it's uh, very nice to aspire towards it, but actually doing it is requires a lot of blood, sweat, and tears because it's not easy. Um, because, you know, as organizations, I think as uh, the plenary speaker was saying, right, we're all focused on scaling our own work, but we have to scale what works. And to scale what works or to even figure out what works really requires a lot of collaboration. And I think for us, and I think also it's kind of difficult to talk about Asia as a whole. It's, it's too broad and diverse uh, because the Indian ecosystem is far more mature, for example, than Southeast Asia, where we are at least 10 years behind. So I think like difficult to talk about, but like, let me focus on Southeast Asia and what we're doing. I think for us, uh, addressing this missing middle or what we are actually calling the greater missing middle, because we think it starts earlier, even starting from $5,000 beyond microfinance. Um, because microfinance funds women uh, mostly, 
but what about, I don't know what happens in the next level. <laughs> because once we go to the next level, then those numbers significantly drop. So that's what we're trying to focus. And uh, the one way that we have been doing it is really uh, building a co-investment platform. So it's been sort of three, four years of uh, uh, love and a lot of tears. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's really the reason that, you know, I felt that it was urgent for us in the part of the world that we are in, in the Philippines and broadly in that region, <laughs> is that the risk appetite of the investors that existed um, and what the entrepreneurs needed, the gap was too much. And uh, and you, there's no, you cannot keep training the entrepreneurs because they're not going to get there. So there's something else that we needed to create, which is really alternate pools of capital. And in a young ecosystem where uh, these examples don't exist, and especially impact investment, like philanthropy and then tech and you know, commercial investment exists, but it's in between, you know, it took me three years of many conversations to like even for us to like agree on like what it means. Um, and so what we've done is actually bring together about 20 investors on a platform uh, and very painfully doing, you know, co-investment deal by deal over the last few years. So I have, so out of the 20, about eight are quite active. And so we've done a few uh, completely tailored, flexible financing instruments. Uh, we've, you know, we've, and we started with actually learning journeys, 10 week learning journeys that we all go through impact investment learning. And at the end of the 10 weeks, we work on a live deal. We do due diligence together, see what questions each other are asking because it's new. It's quite new still in the region. And so that journey has taken us. And then we realized that doing the equity investment, co-investment is taking too long. So now we've actually changed gears to working capital, which they all understand because many of them are actually lenders. You know, they have some lending products already, not at this stage, not an impact investing. And so that is moving much faster. And uh, I also run a blended financing facility. So we have a loss guarantee that has really helped provide some incentives for co-investment. But what I learned through this experience, so for three years, I almost gave up in the second year because I was like, this is too hard. <laughs> But something changed. I don't know. The stars aligned or whatever. And now we, we have been doing like 10 deals, you know, in, in a matter of three months, which is crazy. Uh, but I think for people to understand that and trust that my process and your process and like we can trust each other's process took a while. Um, and for the investors, because they're all doing this for the first time, to, for them to understand how do I assess this early stage risk? Um, and, you know, how do I really price that risk? I think that was really tough. And I think once we all realize that we will set aside, you know, you know, thinking that only we know each know best, I think it has helped us move forward. And it's still difficult, but I think everyone is excited to invest together. So that's, uh, that's been our journey so far. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to, you know, say that um, for foundation, um, we wanted to be more catalytic. And then those, you know, risk capital is something that, you know, foundation I expected to provide. <laughs> <laughs> so especially in the uh, U.S., you know, you guys are doing much, much better. But it, it, now at the moment in Japan, because of the legislation, it's really, really hard for the public charitable foundation to really um, provide risk capital. However, I re recently learned that the catalytic capital that was this defined by catalytic capital consortium, yeah, they started to I expand their definition to include <laughs> grants as well. Yeah. So I think, you know, even though it's not the ca catalytic investment capital, but then still we could be catalytic enough by utilizing grants. So one of the examples I wanted to share is in Cambodia. So what we do, for example, is to work, work with uh, impact venture capital and also local investors network and also ADB, Asia, Asia Development Bank. So four of us together, you know, created a program, an accelerator program for early stage startups and SMEs, uh, gender agnostic, uh, sector agnostic. But then still, we try to make this program as gender smart as possible. So there are lots of you know, hints, and I wouldn't really say that, it's a <laughs> trademark. But then uh, made it very, very obvious that the women are very welcome. So at the end of the day, you know, we attracted women entrepreneurs a lot more. So that in that program, we have 20 cohort members, and then just narrowing down to seven, to four, to two. And then through that uh, business, incubate, uh, business acceleration program, 
we provide the grant, $5,000, $10,000, and then $15,000. So that by the end of the you know, last two remaining, they could really have 30000 And by then, we are hoping that you know, they could be investment ready. Mm. So the first time around in Cambodia, we did that. It's called Chennai Accelerator Program. We are actually very successful. Mm. So out of the four remaining, three have already attracted an investment from outside. Uh, amounting 300,000 US dollars. So that was a significant um, success for us. And then Cambodia is still very small in, in terms of the ecosystem. So we uh, heard that then other people wanted to join. So now we have um, USAID and Australian government and then Cambodian government come to this you know, program. So we're gonna have the, the second cohort starting soon. So we try to really bring everybody together and then try to really you know, tailor made their um, needs with grants, three grants, incremental grants. And then by the time that they finish, they can really you know, fly off for the investment. So I think, again, the collaboration is key. That's fantastic and, and regular, you can, answer as you will, but I am curious, I mean, because you're working in the informal economy and you want to um, invest in models that are inclusive but can scale, like what does that look like? And maybe you can, you know, talk about some of the um, uh, informal sector kind of entrepreneurs that you've invested in. We do not invest in the informal sector per se because the informal sector often ha doesn't have the um, the legal framework or company set up to for for an investor as we are to invest in, um, and that is often the case, right? And 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 that's something I think generally we should reconsider how we give uh, um, access women access to capital um, because there's so many opportunities out there where they may just not qualify because they don't have an LLC or whatever they need. Um, but from our case, how we engage with them is if you invest in a company um, which, which does recycle plastic, right? They need to get the plastic from somewhere. So they have their network of, of, of um, aggregators or organizations who collect the material. That can be a women-owned uh, uh, um, plastic bank or it can be a women cooperative um, which collects material. So what we do is that the companies we invest in who recycle the plastic, they build up their own network of where they get the material that within that supply chain upstream with whom they work together, we know that they have, they, they go by our framework, um, they are, there is transparency, traceability, and that's how we can engage them. So that a lot of the informal waste workers can become formal. Because they've given an ID, they have it's it's non cash based, right? They can actually have their savings account and everything. So that that's the way how we can engage and embrace it and bring them in, rather than you know neglect. Um, but it is very difficult in in as a as a as a private investor um, to to really um, invest in the informal sector. I've done that in my past. Um, through my, my work before working in, in, in these settlements and, and work with the community leaders, but it has been really difficult to, to find investors who are willing to do so. They have all their governance structures, right, and oversight. And, and so that's why I think we need to generally rethink what kind of financial instruments we need to give access, to give capital to those women and women cooperatives and communities. And your model too, um, you work with a lot of, you partner with a lot of big brands. So are they off taking, like they're the customer for some of these um, companies? Yes, uh, that's that's part of our, I think, our strengths or, or, or unique uh, proposition, I would say, that while the investors, the big brands, um, like Unilever, Procter & Gamble, they invest in our fund, but on the other side, they also partner up with our investee companies, our portfolio companies in product development. There's really great new products coming out of recycled uh, uh, PCR resin. Um, they are the off-takers in, in most of the cases because they're all committed to a certain percentage of their packaging being from recycled content, but they're not in material recovery business right that's not their business but they they take us as their means to help to to build that supply chain and then take the material so this partnership is really critical because i think 
we we didn't talk. It's 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 not just about just providing capital, technical assistance, network, uh, access to to these corporate brands. We talk procurement, right? We get we work with them to be ready to actually procure from them um, and really strengthen these partnerships. And I think again, here comes then particularly for women entrepreneurs, it's even more critical <laughs> because they need that access to those brands and and so we can give that to them by investing, by us investing in them and them, them trusting in us. That's great. Um, does anyone have any questions at this point or are you working in some of these same areas that you want to share something about? I have a question. Oh, great. Um, my name is Layla. I'm speaking of not from my current role, which is at RMI, but from previous roles and things I've seen. Kind of a tough question that I don't even like, which is like, I have been in the position of creating a, a blended finance facility, seeking philanthropic funding, from a funder that had a gender lens and really struggling with it because of what we were trying to do and how our, and the focus I should have mentioned is on climate change and like the need to really expedite the energy transition in places like Southeast Asia in the Philippines where if you're working with utilities, if you're working with like energy solar developers, they're there aren't women working at those at those um, places. So, like, if that's going to be a limitation to getting funding, like, what's the trade-off? What's like, how much do you push? How much do you? I feel like <laughs> in the role I was in, it was like a lot of fluff. <laughs> it was really, it was really hard. We are not a gender lens investor. We are a gender smart investor. The industry we're in, we would not find, when we look at the sheer problem we have at hand, as I mentioned, we need to solve. If you were to only invest in women, we would not resolve the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's why there's, for us, there's a difference. It is an extra layer on top to seek out those women who are out there and deserve capital. But it is a, a global problem we have and we need to invest in the businesses uh, out there which are, in our opinion, the best or have the best opportunity to grow and then help them to become more sensitive to the topic and embrace it. It's, uh, that's, that's our approach. I think one way, you know, a lot, some of the funders that we work with actually don't have a gender lens, but we still continue with our gender smart approach in measuring. Um, and then when we reported it back in future funding runs, not to us, but when they started actually funding other initiatives. So we've seen some of that. So I think it really depends on, you know, the. it's difficult when the funder is, you know, not interested in this maybe because it doesn't have or your project doesn't today have that gender impact, right? But I think only if we measure, then can we know actually what can change. And in some cases, maybe it won't. But uh, in others, uh, it might just take a longer time because even maybe the business or the project itself um, may not be in a position to actually measure that or have women working in that, you know, especially if it's in these type of sectors. And we see that a lot in, in construction and you know, uh, shelter tech, which Lisa and I have worked on a lot. Uh, and when we try to apply sort of a gender lens and measure, the, there is no one here. <laughs> there are no women here <laughs> to be counted. But a lot of the time we got that feedback, but we still have to do it. Calling me out. <laughs> I had the, the privilege to work with Priya and Regula and Sasakawa Peace Foundation adjacently um, on the Shelter Tech project. And it, I'm focused on climate tech and the built environment in my work, so that's a perfect fit for my efforts supporting entrepreneurs through that effort. Uh, and now I'm turning the page into, you know, emerging fund manager in that same thesis space. Uh, we don't have a gender lens for our approach, but we are a gender lens organization. So, like, as you said, Regula, um, it's not a, a gender equity fund, but every intention that I have is to promote gender equity through all of my efforts and in all of my conversations. So. I think it's an important opportunity as a fundraiser when I talk to LPs to bring this element into the conversation mm. and not be afraid of, you know, 
that question of, is that gonna narrow your portfolio? Well, I don't have a quota for the portfolio. I'm thinking about gender in the way I approach everything I do mm. in terms of sourcing, due diligence, partnerships, the way that we all work together. Yeah. Um, well said, and wouldn't success be when you don't have to have a gender lens because there are so many like really great women entrepreneurs that everybody will just want to invest in, which is why your ecosystem work is so important. Um, anyone else? Any investors in the audience? Okay, well, um, we, I, I wanted, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about the um, tailored financing, um, but I, I, is there more to say on that? I mean, I think um, that came out loud and clear that um, you really have to meet some of these women entrepreneurs where they are, and there is a need for that catalytic layer um, or, you know, guarantees or, you know, whatever the the instrument is. But is, is anyone doing anything creative in, in that regard? Yeah. Uh, I feel like... Uh, all alternate and tailored is at the moment very creative because it is not the norm. Uh, it is, I think, right now, like, you know, there's, you know, I think globally, not as much in Southeast Asia and definitely not in the Philippines, it is quite difficult to still do that. So for us, we are taking it on a deal by deal basis and seeing, you know, we really see the impact of this entrepreneur, we really want to support them. And then we actually look at, do the due diligence and see actually, because what sometimes they ask us for is not what they need also, going back to that investments literacy issue. So then we are really sort of tailoring, you know, what that is needed. It is not possible to do if the investors that, you know, for example, that I've lined up don't have the mindset to be able to do it. So currently the way that we're working is that they are actually saying, okay, I have, you know, $300,000 that I can play with. So, okay, let me come to this co-investment, you know, Impact Pioneers, and then we'll do this together. And then maybe they can graduate to my other products. So that's kind of one way that we've been trying to do. But things that we've been doing is really more revenue-based, uh, flexible repayment schedules, uh, restructuring without any penalty, uh, things like that, because these are super early stage entrepreneurs and, you know, this is probably the first time they're taking formal financing. And we also want them to build credit history so that they can graduate to other more formal products. That's really Do you want to give an example of one? Because I, you, you have the um, incub the accelerator, right? So yeah. give us an example of a company sure. that you so, help go through that. Yeah, so very quickly, uh, the first ever sort of flexible or tailored financing instrument that we did was actually a credit line, uh, which typically is only sort of given to you know businesses that have you know, a lot of cash flow history, very predictable sort of cash flow. Uh, and so, but the reason that we chose to was that the entrepreneur who was running a peer-to-peer -peer lending for agribusiness decided that they will also kind of move into the retailing of some of the products from the farmers. Uh, and it was a experiment, but they actually did not need, it is highly seasonal. And so they only needed it for very, very short uh, periods of time and it uh, even sort of a short term working capital did not make sense because uh, the need sort of varied quite a lot. So hence we sort of parked a pot of money that you know three investors said okay we really like this business and we said okay let's structure it as a credit line and see how it works. Uh, it took a long time to write that uh, loan, <laughs> the, the agreement because uh, you know we were we really wanted to be as flexible as um, needed and also try and provide a friendly rate, interest rate to the entrepreneur. So that's, you know, something that we've done. So credit lines, you know, you don't get it unless you have three years of profitability, for example, in the Philippines. So for somebody who had, you know, was not even cash flow positive yet, I think it was quite an innovative instrument and they're doing well. I don't know whether this is considered innovative, but then <laughs> <laughs> uh, for for very early stage uh, social enterprise in the Philippines, we decided to have the crowdfunding platform and a campaign. Yeah, so we try to look for you know crowdsourcing for the fund at the beginning. So this is the way that you know we wanted to really you know build on their you know uh, credit, and then later on they can really you know fly off to different uh, in investors but then at the really really early stage we wanted to help them to you know get some capital so that's what we have been doing 
And I think we were getting the one minute mark. So we're, can I just ask the panelists for like really quick, let's treat it like a lightning round, um, kind of closing remarks, anything you want to leave the audience with, like your one, one or two um, big ideas or calls to action. <laughs> okay, let me start. Easier to you know start from the <laughs> <laughs> first. So I wanted to say three things. The first is that you know, we need to change the narrative that in applying the gender lens is always not a cost. It's an opening door and then new opportunities. Everybody will talk about, this, for example, GX, you know, green transformation. Everybody was so hyped up and then really you know looking in the forward looking innovation and then growth. But then gender lens is something like an add-on, something that you need to really look into, and then something that is limiting the portfolio, et cetera. But then we need to change the narrative. This really opens up the you know, different door. Number two is that you know, since we are impact investors and impact investing, it definitely we need to make the impact transparent. So we need to really set up impact measurement management system and then also true to the theory of change and then really track the, the impact so that we don't really do the impact washing. The third one is this title, the cross collaboration, cross sector collaboration. That's definitely a key. Okay. And the foundation is not just a grant maker. We could be the catalytic partner, strategic partner for you. So let's, tr let's talk and then we can really you know, try to find a way that we can really work together. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So I feel like I, I'm, next year when I come to SOCAP, I'm going to come with a placard which will say, fund Southeast Asia. And I'm, I'm going to be the, that, you know, that guy with the placard, right? Like who is uh, viral on social media. Maybe I should do that tomorrow. I don't know. So that's my first call. I think uh, Southeast Asia is a very young ecosystem and sometimes... In most of the global conferences I'm going, I'm like hunting for the people. So thank you to everybody who came here, uh, you know, to figure out who's interested in the region. So I think we are young and growing, growing pretty fast. Uh, it is the fastest growing economies globally. But somehow in the impact investment conferences, we're not as sexy. Uh, so I'm going to figure out how to make us sexy as we go. Uh, but I think uh, there may be a lot of donor and funder fatigue because a lot of these ecosystem building initiatives have already been tried in India. It's already been tried in Latin America and Africa. Now everybody wants the next new thing. But actually, we don't need anything new. We just need to build the foundation. And that's what we really need support on. So that's my first call. I, I don't know. The, probably this needs to be said in the plenary with like thousands of people. But <laughs> let's say it anyway. Uh, I think the second piece is that I think uh, we have to... A lot of the times we have a global and a regional approach, but I think it's very important to work with local partners. I think this was the message in the plenary as well. Because we are on the ground, we understand there's a huge cost to due diligence, and I think we can help mitigate that as people on the ground, because you know we're already probably working with the pipeline. And somehow, uh, in the pandemic, it happened a lot more because no one could fly in. But now we are back to flying in and flying out. So I think, uh, and you know, sometimes we miss the opportunity for collaboration, which is right in front of us. So I think uh, we have to work very actively. These are very young and uh, growing, but also difficult markets uh, for impact investing. We have not had any exits yet in Southeast Asia. We are all looking for them. So we have to going to have to figure this out together. There's no other way forward. So I think we really have to collaborate uh, radically. Um, and uh, there's a lot to be learned from other ecosystems that we can adapt, but we don't have to take that long to make learn those lessons. So I hope that you know we can really share uh, and not be in our silos as much, because I think that's the only way that we're going to be able to move forward. <laughs> um. Particularly, I mean, I focus now on South and Southeast Asia. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that the small and or micro, small and mid-sized enterprises are the backbone of the economy, uh, not just in South and Southeast Asia, but everywhere. Uh, in the context of what, where we live and oper and work, the half of these businesses are owned by women, and we know they are low tech and they have lower profitability because they don't have access to capital and many other things. It is all known. We don't need more data. We don't need more concepts. All I'm 
thinking is we know how we can get done. And what my hope is in my dream and what I try to convey is that at the end of the day, it's about action. And action for me is with, with, with a clear intention to every day, step by step, implement these projects. It is, it is, it, it, it just can be done. We just need to be very intentional and aware and always reflecting on what we, what is really the best for, for, for these communities and what they think, they tell us what they need. And then we just need to implement. Capital is out there. I mean, I'm shocked sometimes where capital goes. It's not that there is no capital. We just need to be intentional in where we want the capital to go and what we want the capital to do.